Abnormal uterine bleeding. Abnormal uterine bleeding encompasses any significant deviation from normal frequency, regularity, duration, and volume of menstrual bleeding. So, what are the characteristics of a normal menstruation? Let's start with frequency. For the frequency of menses, the mean interval is 28 days, plus or minus 7 days. Hence, if bleeding occurs at intervals less than 21 days or more than 35 days, it is considered abnormal. The mean duration of normal menstrual flow is about 4 days. So bleeding for longer than 7 days is considered prolonged. For the volume, the normal volume is about 5 to 80 ml per cycle. So the question is, how do we record this subjective description? So when getting the history from our patients, it would be wise to show a pictograph to help the women describe the volume of menstrual flow and this pictograph will go on very handy. This is a pictograph for the assessment of menstrual blood loss. It has a visual representation for the volume for standard sanitary pads and that of a tampoon. With this, we will be able to get a better estimate on the blood loss. So a half soap pad is approximately 5 ml. If a woman reports 4 to 5 changes in a day, that is about 25 ml multiplied by the number of days that will give us about 100 ml of MBL for that cycle. Remember, beyond 80 ml of MBL or menstrual blood loss, it is already considered heavy and abnormal. This is an image of a menstrual cup. It has varied sizes and capacity. AUB may occur at any time between menarche and menopause. Its incidence may range up to 9 to 20 percent. The investigation and management of AUB has been hampered by inconsistently applied nomenclature in categorizing etiologies of bleeding. The following are old terms which has overlapping definitions. These are as follows. Menorrhagia refers to exceedingly heavy or long periods. Metrorrhagia, abnormal bleeding that occurs between periods or that is not associated with menstruation. Menometrorrhagia are long, heavy, and irregular menses. On the other hand, polymenorrhea refers to cycles that are shorter than 21 days. On the other hand, oligomenorrhea are infrequent, very light menses that is more than 35 days in interval. Hypomenorrhea are short or scanty periods. Use of the above-mentioned nomenclature is not encouraged anymore. Amenorrhea is still being used, meaning absence of menses, and of course, dysmenorrhea referring to painful menses. To simplify AUB, these new terminologies has been adopted. It's heavy menstrual bleeding and intermenstrual bleeding. For the heavy menstrual bleeding, it is classified as acute AUB, which is an episode of heavy bleeding that, in the opinion of the clinician, is of sufficient severity to require immediate intervention to prevent further blood loss. It may present in a context of an existing chronic AUB or might occur without such a background history. Chronic AUB, on the other hand, is defined as abnormal bleeding that has been present for the majority of the past six months. The term menorrhagia 
refers to excessive menstrual bleeding, but it's not to be used anymore. Instead, we use the term heavy menstrual bleeding. Metroragia refers to bleeding between clearly defined cyclic and predictable menses, but should not be used anymore. Instead, we use the term intermenstrual bleeding. The term DUB, which was previously used as a diagnosis when there was no systemic or locally definable structural cause for the AUB, is not included in the system and should be abandoned. It used to be considered a wastebasket diagnosis for non-organic causes of AUB. Now, the causes of AUB can be described by a universally accepted systemic nomenclature. This system was reported by the FIGO in 2011. It classifies causes of AUB into nine main categories, which are arranged according to the acronym PAMCOIN. For causes of AUB only in non-gravid women of the reproductive age. So it's divided into structural and non-structural causes. And this was developed to create a universally accepted nomenclature. So the mnemonics goes like this. For POM, for structural causes of AUB, P for polyp, A for adenomyosis, L for leiomyoma, and M for malignancy in, and hyperplasia. COIN is for the non-structural causes of AUB. C for coagulopathy, O for ovulatory dysfunction, E for endometrial causes, I for iatrogenic, and N not yet classified. The etiologies that constitute the first group or the POM group are structural or histologic causes that are diagnosed through imaging or biopsy. On the other hand, those that compose the second group, the COIN group, are non-structural. As mentioned earlier, this group was previously called DUB and should no longer be favored and should be discarded. In the past, this term has represented causes of abnormal bleeding when structural causes and other specific defects such as coagulation defects has been excluded. Cases that previously would have been described as DUB are now referred to as AUB due to ovulatory dysfunction or endometrial causes. Let's start with polyps. Polyps are widely recognized structural abnormalities causing AUB. However, the precise mechanism by which they increase bleeding are poorly understood. It occurs in all age groups and may present with heavy menstrual bleeding, intermenstrual bleeding, and even postmenopausal bleeding. They usually present with dysmenorrhea. So the diagnosis, if you use the palm coin, we write the term, we write the letters A U B dash P subscript one if the polyp is present. In this slide, the first image is a hysteroscopic image of a polyp, the one labeled P. On the next image, this is an ultrasound image of the said polyp. Adenomyosis. These are endometrial glands that found its way through the myometrium. The hypothesis of it causing AUB are as follows. It increases the endometrial surface. Secondly, it alters the PGF and PGE balance. It hampers myometrial contractility. And this, their abnormal myometrial angiogenesis is associated with fragile blood vessels. This is an MRI image of adenomyosis showing a thicker anterior myometrial wall compared to the posterior. The second image is that of an ultrasound showing the same. The ultrasound criteria for adenomyosis comprise the minimum requirement 
for its diagnosis in the classification system. So our diagnosis would be AUB-A subscript 1. Leiomyoma is one of the most common causes of AUB. It is further classified into eight categories, 0 to 8. Of importance to AUB is the submucosal type, since this is associated with prolonged menses. The submucosal type has three categories, type 0, wherein the mass is pedunculated and is almost 100% intracavitary. Type 1, it is less than 50% intramural. And type 2, it is more than 50% intramural. It has been suggested that myoma-related AUB may result from an increased surface area of the endometrium due to mechanical distortion, ulceration, and hemorrhage of the endometrium overlying the submucous myoma. Interference by the myoma with normal uterine homeostasis is also a cause. Mechanical compression of the venous drainage by the myomas at any site and dilatation of the venous plexuses draining the endometrium. Malignancy and hyperplasia. The diagnosis must be considered in any woman in the reproductive and postmenopausal years, especially when there may be predisposing factors such as obesity or a history of chronic anovulation. Coagulopathy encompasses the spectrum of systemic disorders of hemostasis that may result in AUB. The disorders of blood coagulations like von Willebrand disease and protrombin deficiency has an overall prevalence of 13%. Disorders that produce platelet deficiencies like leukemia, severe sepsis, idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura, and hypersplenism. This classification of coagulopathy should include women on chronic anticoagulation. Although such AUB may be considered to be iatrogenic, it would be more appropriate to include them under this classification. The group determined it would be more appropriate to classify disaffected women as having a coagulopathy. Presentation of patients with coagulopathy would include the following. Heavy menstrual bleeding since menarche. Any of the following like history of postpartum hemorrhage, history of surgical related bleeding, history of bleeding associated with dental work. And for the following symptoms, two or more of this one, bruising of one to two times per month, spontaneous bruising, uh, spontaneous epistaxis of one to two times a month, frequent gum bleeding, and a family history of bleeding. Ovulatory dysfunction manifests as unpredictable timing of bleeding and a variable amount of flow, which in some cases results in heavy menstrual bleeding. Causes of this ovulatory dysfunction may be as follows. Obesity, low birth weight, weight change, psychological stress, elite athletes, which are mostly amenorrheic, hypothyroidism, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and hyperandrogenic disorders, hyperprolactinemia, luteal autophase cycles, endocrinopathy, or it can be idiopathic. The condition is related to the absence of predictable cyclic production of progesterone. Hence, in the later reproductive years, it occurs as a consequence of luteal autophase events.
endometrial. This is caused by local disturbances in endometrial function. It can also be deficiencies or excesses of proteins or other entities that has an adverse impact on hemostasis. In the presence of HMB, there may be a primary disorder of mechanisms regulating local endometrial hemostasis itself. Secondary to deficiencies in local production of vasoconstrictors, such as endothelium 1 and prostaglandin F2, and or accelerated lysis of endometrial clot because of excessive production of plasminogen activator and increased local production of substances that promote vasodilatation, such as prostaglandin E2 and prostacycline. At present, there is no specific available test for these disorders, so the diagnosis of AUB-E should be determined by exclusion of other identifiable abnormalities in women of reproductive years who appear to have normal ovulatory function. Iatrogenic causes of AUB with the use of systemic pharmacotherapy like gonadal steroids, especially estrogens, progesterone, or testosterone, other drugs such as antidepressant drugs. This would cause irregular bleeding. It may also cause inconsistent use resulting to breakthrough. There can be an interference with coagulation and it has an influence with systemic control of ovulation. Last category is the not yet classified. Included in this one are the AV malformations and myometrial hypertrophy, which causes heavy menstrual bleeding. So how do we use this system? Remember, the pump coin classification is only for non-gravid women of reproductive age presenting with abnormal uterine bleeding. So we already have a checklist on what are the probable causes of AUB. We just have to indicate the subscripts of 1 if the lesion is present, 0 if it is absent, or a question mark it, it has not yet been assessed. For our first case, RF, 15 years old, came in due to heavy menstrual bleeding for the past two weeks. She would soak about two to three pads per day. And her menstrual history, she had her menarche three years ago, so at 12 years old. Remember, the age of puberty is about 10 to 12 years old, which is about average of the patient had. So what other pertinent data in the clinical history and physical examination should be elicited? This would be history of heavy menstrual bleeding since her menarche, history of easy bruising, gum bleeding, epistaxis, history of systemic diseases, family history of hematologic disorders, intake of medications, sexual history, and evaluate for the presence of bruises, sites of bleeding in any part of the body. And... Pregnancy should always be ruled out. Laboratory examination should be requested. And this can be the following. A CBC should be determined to detect anemia. Pregnancy tests, of course. Pregnancy should always be ruled out. Coagulation profile. These are considered only in women with AUB since the onset of menarche, and have a personal and a family history suggestive of coagulopathy. An ultrasound can be done, preferred transrectal in this age, because it's needed to evaluate and rule out 
structural abnormalities. So these are the laboratory results of the patient. She had a hemoglobin, a slightly low hemoglobin of 102. Pregnancy test was negative. Coagulation profile was within normal. A transabdominal ultrasound was done instead. She has a small uterus, a thin endometrium, and normal ovaries. There was no mass seen. What then would be our diagnosis? Remember, an ovulation, which is about 46%, is the most common cause of AUB in adolescent. And this is followed by hematologic diseases in about 30 per, 33%. So our diagnosis in this case is AUB, secondary to ovulatory dysfunction. So the pump coin diagnosis is AUB-O subscript 1. Is this pattern of bleeding expected in the patient and why? Yes, it is expected because of the immaturity of the HPO axis. Irregular menses are common in the first few years following menarche. However, they are expected to become regular in the next 5 to 7 years. In puberty, the HPO axis has not yet developed the necessary hormonal feedback to sustain the endometrium is not yet there. For our second case, it is CA. She is 30 years old, newly gravid, with a chief complaint of prolonged and heavy menstrual bleeding for the past two cycles. She had her menarche at 12 years old. Her menses then were regular at 28 to 30 days interval with no associated dysmenorrhea. She had her LMP 8 days prior to this consult and she is still bleeding up to this point, soaking about 4 to 5 pads per day. So based on this one, it's already beyond 7 days, so definitely it's subnormal. The past menstrual period was 6 weeks ago, so that's beyond 35 days ago, so that's also abnormal. For the physical exam, vital signs were normal. Her BMI is 21, and she still has pinkish palpebral conjunctiva. On physical examination, there were no masses seen in the vagina and in the cervix. The uterus was not enlarged and there was no agnexal masses palpated nor any tenderness. So is the menstruation of the patient normal? We have already identified that the frequency of her menses is infrequent since it's over 38 days and the duration of flow is also prolonged. What other clinical Pertinent data in the history and physical exam should be elicited. For the history, we have to determine the frequency, duration, amount of bleeding, relation to menstrual period, and onset of symptoms. We should also check for presence of symptoms such as postcoital bleeding, pelvic pain or pressure, dysmenorrhea. This may suggest structural or histologic abnormality. Pregnancy should always be ruled out. Drug or hormone intake has to be identified. A general survey should always include assessment for systemic diseases like thyroid diseases. An abdominal examination may reveal an enlarged uterus on pelvic exam. When we inspect the vulva and the vagina, it is essential to check for lesions, such as a polyp, which may be a source of the bleeding. The bimanual examination will allow assessment of the uterine size, pelvic tenderness, and agnexal masses. Laboratory examinations done on this patient are as follows. A pregnancy test, 
to rule out pregnancy-related causes since it is the most common cause of AUB in the reproductive age group. CBC, which has a level A recommendation to assess severity of AUB, hemodynamic stability, and be guided with the management if iron supplementation, hospital admission, or blood transfusion is necessary. And lastly, an ultrasound to rule out any organic or structural causes. So it turns out her hemoglobin is normal, pregnancy test is negative, and the TBS showed a normal-sized uterus with thick endometrium at 0.8 cm and a 1 cm intracavitary polypoid mass which is noted to be attached at the fundal area. Our next case is AD. She is 46 years old, gravity 3, para 3, with a chief complaint of prolonged menses. Three months prior to this consult, she noted longer intervals, followed by heavier than usual bleeding, which would last for about 10 to 12 days, and she would soak about 5 to 6 pads per day with tolerable dysmenorrhea. Her menstrual history are irregular, occurring with 1 to 2 months interval for the past year, four to five days duration, with moderate to profuse in amount. For her PMP, which is two months prior to consult, it's about five days duration, soaking about four pads per day, with tolerable dysmenorrhea. So, what is important in her obstetric history? She is multigravid. All her pregnancies were delivered spontaneously, and last of which was 10 years ago. She has no method of contraception. So for this patient, what is abnormal in her menstruation? Firstly, it is infrequent since, since it comes every one to two months. Duration of flow is prolonged and the volume is definitely heavy. For her past medical history, she had slight elevation of blood sugar, and she is on diet modification with no need for any medications. She has no hypertension. Personal and social history, she, has an, she is an accountant and married for the past 17 years. She is a non-smoker and is an alcoholic beverage drinker. During her pelvic exam, it was noted that the external genitalia is normal, Vagina is normal, cervix is smooth, no erosions, no masses, with minimal bleeding per os. On by manual examination, the uterus is not enlarged, there are no agnexal masses, no any tenderness. Our patient is 46 years old, multigravid, presenting with AUB for the past 12 months. By definition, she falls under the category of perimenopause. Perimenopause is a transitional time of two to eight years prior to menopause that is usually characterized by change in normal menstrual cycle and lasting up to 12 months after. Cycles may become shorter or longer and flow may vary from light to heavy. As a woman approaches menopause, the function of her ovaries gradually declines. Once she completes a year without menstruation, she has arrived at menopause. Average age of menopause is 51. However, it can occur any time after the age of 40. Bleeding during the perimenopause is possibly the single most common symptom. Menstrual cycles can be heavier than usual and shorter than normal, sometimes even accompanied by severe premenstrual syndrome. This can impair a woman's ability to carry out normal activities during that time. The menopausal transition, although no single endocrine marker can be used to signal the onset of perimenopausal transition. The rise in serum FSH appears to be the most dependable laboratory assessment in normally cycling women. What other pertinent data in the clinical history and physical exam should be elicited 
for our history and physical exam, we have to determine onset frequency and duration of menses, presence of pain, change in menstrual pattern, age, parity, marital status, sexual history, and use of contraception, use of medications, dates of pregnancies, and symptoms of pregnancy and reproductive tract disease. Laboratory examinations should be requested in this patient, such as routine tests like CBC to determine the presence of anemia, a pregnancy test to rule out any bleeding due to pregnancy, especially in women of reproductive age group, and until the time she reaches the menopausal period. A transvaginal ultrasound to determine the presence of lesions like polyps, myomas, which are very common anatomic conditions causing AUB in the perimenopausal period. Most importantly, to determine endometrial thickness. An endometrial thickness of more than 5 mm would warrant an endometrial assessment. So confirmatory tests, such as in this case, can include an FSH and estradiol determination, although not routinely requested, since a rise in serum FSH and a decrease in estradiol may signal the onset of the perimenopausal transition. Estradiol reflects the amount of levels of ovarian reserve. Considering the menstrual history and the age of the patient, one must evaluate for any structural or histologic abnormality. Hence, an endometrial biopsy is recommended in this case. A CISH can also be done, which is saline infusion sonohysterography, which may be requested if it is difficult to ascertain the endometrial echo or the endometrial stripe of more than 5 mm. However, in this patient, it is not necessary to perform this procedure. And lastly, a hysteroscopy guided biopsy can also be an option. Laboratory results of the patient are as follows. Her pregnancy test is negative. CBC showed normal findings. The ultrasound revealed an endometrial thickness of 1.2, which is thick for her age. Cutoff is 50, 50 mm. The serum FSH is 12, which is within really normal. Estradiol is less than 35. For postmenopausal women, levels of estradiol is from 0 to 30. Differential diagnosis for this case would include hormonal, structural, or a metaplastic process. An ovulation and uterine fibroids are the most common hormonal and structural causes of AUB in the late reproductive to menopausal transition age group. What is the appropriate management for this patient? A confirmatory test of doing an endometrial biopsy is warranted in this case due to presence of a thickened endometrium. Other indications for endometrial biopsy as per ACO guidelines are all women more than 35 years old presenting with AUB. Even per patients less than 35 years old, if bleeding is refractory to medical management and for patients on tamoxifen therapy. The endometrial biopsy result is a disordered proliferative endometrium. And this is the first histologic sign of chronic anovulation. What then is our diagnosis? It is abnormal uterine bleeding secondary to ovulatory disorder. And that is AUB O subscript 1. Abnormal uterine bleeding is one of the most common complaints during the perimenopausal transition as cycles become irregular. Consider these conditions. Four to six weeks interval between periods is considered normal during this transition. 
But if cycles are less than 21 days, one has to seek consultation. Very heavy bleeding longer than the usual period. If bleeding lasts for more than a week or if bleeding occurs after bleeding period free for the past six months. If spotting or bleeding occurs every week or two weeks or even in between periods. So we have presented three cases of AUB. One for a structural problem, the patient with endometrial polyp, and two cases with ovulatory problems. One in her adolescent age and one in her perimenopausal transition state. That ends our lecture on AUB and thank you.